I will introduce you uh, briefly. Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dave Hong. Dave is an uh, alumnus, so hey, welcome to visit us again. And uh, he is a former, uh, a former founder and the CEO of two related startups, Ethan Mine, Mining and uh, ProBlocks. He transformed one of the largest Yellow Pages companies into the web powerhouse called the SuperPage. At its peak, SuperPage generated more than 200, uh, 250 million dollars per year. Without further ado, let's welcome our speaker, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. I attended uh, UTA. I graduated in 1986, I believe. None of these buildings were here. Uh, the facilities are much nicer than they were 32 years ago. But it is a real uh, pleasure. From which department? I was a, a college of business. So, I'm, yeah, I see, I'm a business guy, not a tech guy. Really, I am a tech guy, and I hope you see that at heart. Uh, I attended the College of Business, and I got my degree at that time, and you know, just basically what we called systems analysis. So my uh, train, in fact, the language that we were using in 1986 was COBOL, Common Object-Oriented Business, something like that. Well, COBOL, dead now. Common Business Language. Common, yeah. <laughs> So uh, I learned to write in COBOL. That was a short, uh, uh, short uh, value <laughs> to know COBOL. But uh, uh, basically, um, what I learned to do at UTA was to design business systems, to take a business idea and apply computers and automate processes so that we could do things in different ways, new ways. And it was just by happenstance that after I graduated, Within the next 10 years, the advent of the uh, internet occurred. I, I was on a research team at a company called GTE, which is now Verizon. And we were looking into what was called the information superhighway. And we, we basically, at that time, the first web browser was introduced, the first web server. And we said, this is probably the future. And in 1995, I built what became the world's largest yellow pages on uh, superpages.com. And so uh, you basically took what we were doing, which was making yellow pages, that's information service, right? You're smashing trees, making paper, printing names and phone numbers on it, and dropping those books off of people's houses. We took that process, we put it on a web server, and we took all the boundaries off. So no longer was it about going to just search your city, you could search the whole country, you could search for anything, anywhere, anytime. And so that was kind of what my training at UTA led to in that first phase was just looking at businesses and given the opportunity transforming those businesses with this new technology. Blockchain, I'm so excited, I gotta tell you, I'm so excited to be here because blockchain is the next big thing. We can all see it happening, but there's a lot of cloud of confusion around what it is and what's the value of it, how are we gonna use it, and so that's what uh, we're here to talk about today. Hopefully this goes forward. Will it? It sounds like it's making a dinging sound. Ah, I went the wrong direction. Uh, I do want to start off with this because most of, I, I am a part-time consultant today just by happenstance in this area of cryptocurrency because uh, my son is actually a self-taught systems engineer, builds cu uh, custom computers from scratch and Two years ago, we started building these mining machines to mine uh, dog coin and Bitcoin and different things. And we ended up in 2016, I really liked uh, Ethereum. I'll explain why in a minute. And so, Ethereum's one of the big blockchains, it's the number two cryptocurrency in the world, and we decided to mine that. And in 2017, we decided to tell people we'd help them build these cryptocurrency mines for Ethereum. And uh, so, this is what I've been doing for the last year. Help people in over a dozen countries build mines. And uh, today, one of, a big project has come to us. These guys want us to build containerized cryptocurrency mines in Bali, Indonesia. <laughs> Most of them outside of the US, <clears throat> these mines. Cryptocurrency is not that exciting to me, though, guys. I, 
you know, we build these machines and we manufacture these this stuff, this, these coins or whatever you want to call it, tokens, cryptocurrencies. But it's just not that exciting. It, cryptocurrency to me is kind of like gas. It, it's exciting because you could put it in a car and drive that car and go places. But gas alone is not that exciting, right? The blockchain is the car. And you see this in the media all the time. People are saying, oh, yeah, I don't care about Bitcoin, but I think blockchain is great, right? And that's kind of the story because people are a little bit worried about whether this crypto thing is real or it's going to crash. I have no idea, guys, if Bitcoin is going to be worth 10000 in a year or, you know, nothing or a million. Who knows? How many uh, cryptocurrencies are there? There are over 1,400 cryptocurrencies. And that's... Um, my point, my thought on that is that a thousand of them got to die pretty soon, <laughs> because we don't. The world doesn't need. There's not a use case for 1,400 cryptocurrencies. There's not a use case for most cryptocurrencies. We don't need. Like, there's a new crypto called DentaCoin. It's for dentists. Do you really need a special cryptocurrency to pay your dentist, as opposed to what you might give, you know, Kroger's or something? So it doesn't make any sense. A lot of these things. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. Is what makes sense. Because if we're going to work on this in the future, if we have interest in this, uh, let's work on the stuff that makes the most sense, you know. Um, I do want to do a quick poll. <clears throat> How many of you uh, own, a, own Bitcoin or some cryptocurrency? Anybody? <laughs> How many of you in the last six months have done study in the area of blockchain? What, it could be anything. Been looking into blockchain? Okay. How many of you are programmers that program C++, JavaScript, things like that? That's awesome. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, how many of you uh, work on the hardware or networking side? A couple of them on the hardware and networking side. Cool. This, this has all that. It's got the hardware, it's got the network, it's got the software, and so we're going to kind of talk about the software side of it today. So most of you guys are programmers. Um, I will speak to a certain level of, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to talk down or talk up, you know, I want to make sure that I'm kind of communicating with you. If as I'm talking about this, I'm not making a good point or you're not getting it, let me know that. So, But I do want to move now through this kind of quickly because I got about three minutes a slide to tell you a story, a really quick story. And uh, it's a big story, right? I, I was thinking about this. When I contacted you and you so graciously invited me to come in, I had no presentation. But I wrote a quick abstract to say, this is what I'd love to go talk about. And then uh, I formed that story. But it's kind of like, I started thinking, this is kind of like saying, I'm going to come and in one hour, I'm going to describe every world religion and what its beliefs are and how they compare to one another. That would be hard to do in an hour. That's a similar task to what I have here, so I'm going to move uh, kind of quickly. Uh, I just want to start with what a blockchain is. And in today's conversation, you're, you'll see that uh, I believe, and many people believe, that blockchain has gone through three evolutions. And I want to talk to you about where we are in this stage three. Stage one was Bitcoin. Bitcoin came out of a white paper written in 2009 by somebody under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't really know who that is. They still own an enormous amount of Bitcoin, if they still exist. But they basically wrote a paper about how to create the first one of these things. In essence, it's a ledger, okay? A blockchain is blocks that inside each block has a, trans a set of transactions that have been validated, and then the next block, and the next block, and the next block. So a blockchain is really at its heart, it's a ledger. And we can see when money moves from one address to another address. And that's basically what we see when we look inside the blocks and we look at the transactions. This amount went from this address to that address. It's a decentralized and trustless transactional network, which means there is no Bank of America running this thing. There is no visa behind this thing, right? It's a bunch of servers running a consensus algorithm and doing this job with nobody really running it. Now, one of the things uh, you'll notice is that every one of these blockchain projects 
has a major systems development team behind it. So in a sense, the development is pretty centralized, but in its operation, it is completely decentralized. Once they implement something into Bitcoin or another one of these blockchains, that is out there for the public to, uh, to consume. Um, trustless really means there is no trust. So we want to know that if you give me something, if you send me something through a blockchain transaction, <coughs> that you cannot double spin that. You can't send it to me and then also send it to him, that same Bitcoin or whatever it may be. So they really saw, what they saw was the double spin problem. If you think about it, what we had prior to this with say movies or software, people can copy movies and software, people can break the digital rights management and they can make multiple copies of an Avengers movie and everybody can watch it for free, right? You didn't want that with cryptocurrency. You didn't want somebody to be able to take that value and replicate that value and then just share that because it'd be worthless, right? So what the blockchain enables was the elimination of the double spin problem. That's really what Satoshi solved in the white paper uh, with this decentralized and trustless network. Anybody involved in cryptography? Anybody love to geek out on cryptography? Good. Uh, it is uh, cryptography at the essence that makes this thing immutable, and I'll show you what I mean by that on um, the next slide. And then just want to talk to you real quickly about this idea of the cryptocurrency is kind of like the oil in the engine of the blockchain. It's how value is transferred. We're not transferring dollars to one another. We're transferring whatever the crypto is on that blockchain. Uh, and so we'll talk, we'll talk more about that. But value is secured through what those of us who have worked in crypto know is just kind of standard old public-private key stuff. And anybody that's worked with cryptography with public and private keys knows it's an ugly business because these keys are ugly, they're hard to deal with, they're long, they don't make any sense. And But the whole idea of blockchain, if you send me a transaction, I give you my public address, and then the way you would send it is you would sign that with your private key, send me the money, and then if I want to get the money and move it, I've got to sign that transaction with my private key. So it's public and private key cryptography at the heart of it that's making the blockchain secure for value transfer and in the immutability of the record over time, right? So what's in a block? Uh, we'll look at that, we'll look at that. Uh, I think that's perfect uh, leaving question. This is uh, two more points. Everyone has a copy of the blockchain. Since it's decentralized and trustless, excuse me, we all need to validate and verify the information. So if, if you send me a transaction, I want to be able to validate that you have that money. And the way I validate that you have that money is look back into the blockchain to see that you really get that and do you have it. Um, and that's the interesting thing. There are no accounts. There's no idea of an account. If I want to see what you have, we go back in time through the blockchain, see what did you give, what did you get, what did you give, what did you get? And at the end, you could say, I, at the end of the day, I own 3.7 Bitcoin. But there is no account for that. There is no wallet that your money is in. When people talk about a wallet, what they're really talking about is just storing your private keys. That's all you own is private keys, okay? And, uh, but there is a user ID, right? So you need user ID for each user? Uh, it's, it's really these addresses. And a user ID might own a bunch of addresses that represent ownership in, inside the blockchain. But there is no user ID. Now, uh, some of the blockchains like uh, Ethereum and some of the others are implementing a namespace, which means they'll be able, like we did with domains, domain name service, where we didn't have to use IP addresses anymore, now we could use names, like propblocks.com. Same thing is happening in blockchain, so it's likely that you'll have a user-friendly name you can share that will map to you know, a long uh, address. Um, I need to speed up my, I got so much to tell you guys. And, uh, it's, well, we can take it's the whole two hours. Uh, <laughs> This is what the blockchain looks like as it's going along. We're going to kind of not talk about the Genesis block. The first block is a little bit different. But once it's going, a block 
is a bunch of transactions. As transactions occur, let's just take Bitcoin for a second. I want to send you money. So I, I do a transaction, I sign it with my private key. That transaction goes in what's called the mempool. The mempool. And you can see this at blockchain.info. If you go to blockchain.info, you can see everything that's happening on Bitcoin. You can see every block, you can see the transactions in the block, you can follow the addresses and see how much Bitcoin that guy has. <laughs> it's amazing. But so if you look inside the blocks, the transactions are being grouped, and then every 10 minutes, there's a block mine for Bitcoin. For Ethereum, it's about every 30 seconds. So there's different kind of frequencies of these. Every 10 minutes, there's a Bitcoin block mined, and that includes the transactions that got grouped into that block, which are merkleized, they're stored in, a, in, a, in an encrypted fashion. And then we take the hash of the previous block and compute a new block header. That block header now becomes, in essence, the hash or the signature of this one. And what happens is that if anything changed, if I went into here and I changed the transaction, it would break that. And if it broke that, it would break that. And if that's broken, this is broken. So this creates an immutable thing. It's the, uh, the inclusion of the hash of the previous block header. So if the previous block is tampered with, it would destroy that block's uh, header, which is you know, just a, a hash computed with a, a cryptographic Can you explain Merkle rules again? Uh, I'm not an expert on, the, on crypto, but Merkle root kind of takes uh, data and simplifies it down to something that can be de decompiled back to that data. So it gives you almost like a compressed image of of something and it can include both logic and data. Now is this a transaction log of every transaction that's, that's mm -hmm. occurred? Every transaction that has ever occurred and every node on the network has the entire log. Okay. And that, my friends, is one of the huge problems with blockchain. It does not scale. And that's one of the things that we're going to get into as I go through the talk. Because one of the things I want to give you today is I want to give you a bunch of information about blockchain, but I'm going to end with what I think the huge problems are in this space. The problems that we could go solve and probably make a lot of money if we could solve them because there's a bunch of big problems and scalability is one of them. So when you say it's in a network, is it like each node is connected with other in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, the transactions are? Absolutely. Okay. And uh, like you said, there's no institution or organization. So this Ethereum, we know it's like open source, but Bitcoin, like who is making the business out of it? Who's, who's getting it? So that, that in itself is one of the issues as far as how does a development team get incented to continue to develop on a blockchain? Uh, so there are organizations that employ people that develop for the Bitcoin blockchain, but nobody pays them to do that. They just want to have that degree of influence uh, over what's going on. But basically what happens, and we'll kind of touch on this because there's just so many tangents with this thing that Miners are running these machines, and this is what we do. We run machines for Ethereum, and we are competing for the chance to mine the next block. And the more computing power I have, the more probability it is that I win the opportunity to mine the next block. If I win that, it's like a lottery, I mine that block, and I get the block reward. In this case, it's three ETH per block, right? Now, I'm not really getting that today. I'm getting it through I'm a pool, but... Basically, I'm uh, trying to win this opportunity to mine the next block, and when I mine the next block, I then broadcast out to all other nodes that block addition. So now they all update their version of the blockchain with the new block. There are a bunch of issues with that. There are uncles that get created, and there's, there's a, but what is at the heart of that is consensus. There's a consensus mechanism. So there is no organization. There's a consensus mechanism that tries to work out all that traffic management of who's mining the next block, who gets to do that, and then how that's broadcast out to everybody else. Wow, that's a cool sound effect. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. I, I just kind of alluded to this in that, uh, you know, we're miners and we're running a machine that uh, is 
running this hashing algorithm and we are connected to a pool and that pool is a full node on the Ethereum network. That pool has the entire copy of uh, the Ethereum blockchain all the way back to its Genesis block. As a miner, I don't keep it, but everybody that's a node on the network is running a full copy of the blockchain. And to me, it reminds me, I haven't been around many, many years in IT, it almost reminds me of sequential file formats that we had before we had databases. We literally put records, you know, one after another in a sequential file, and then if you wanted to read the file, you had to read the whole thing in to find that record. It's very similar to that. So what's the current number of blocks around? Uh, oh, I don't know, many, many millions. But I, I can give you guys uh, the, like, uh, like each miner has their own number of blocks, each new cryptocurrency, or are they all together? In one so basically, the blockchain is, is a, you know, it's, it's one copy of something. Everybody has a copy of it. As a miner, when I mine a block, a all I'm block. really doing is adding a new block to the chain and then communicating out to everyone that okay, that new block is. My added. question is. Is there one blockchain for all the blockchain technology, or are there hundreds of blockchains by different There's a bunch organizers? of different ones, yeah. yeah. Like we'll how many? If you go to blockchain.info, you can look at the Bitcoin blockchain. And if you go to etherscan.io, you can look at the Ethereum blockchain. And you can see a lot of this. And we could, I could spend a half a day with you guys just talking about mining, because it's... It, it's cool, but again, so, uh, who to, who verifies that you mined a valid block? There has to be some centralized. It is, it is, uh, it is the consensus mechanism that does it. So we'll talk. Let me expand okay. on that in just a second. The role of these miners in this uh, network is that they secure by running the consensus algorithm. They, th there is no central party, so there needs to be some way that we decide what is real and what is not real and what is next and what gets added. And it's done through a consensus algorithm that uses a cryptographic uh, method that we'll talk about uh, in just a second. And, and then as I talked about, miners broadcast the new blocks. Once you've won the right from the network to mine the next block and you mine that block, you then broadcast out, okay, this block has been added and everybody adds it and then they're all trying to fight to mine the next block. Um, this is a long topic I don't want to go into today, but this is what I do a lot of my consulting on. Because most of my clients today are Wall Street analysts who are trying to figure out how the different companies are going to win or lose. Uh, AMD and NVIDIA and Intel and all these companies. And there's a war that's been going on in mining. Satoshi, originally his idea for Bitcoin was that Everybody would just run it on their CPU and we would all make a little Bitcoin and we would, the world would be really cool and libertarian and you know, decentralized. And what happened was some, guy, oops, some guys figured out how to uh, take the process and put it on the graphics card. Well, the graphics card has a way bigger processor and so they could do a lot more of the computations here than these guys. And then some guys figured out how to chain multiple graphics cards together and then run the process on a whole bunch of them at once. That was super powerful. It overcame, you know, these guys now aren't making any money. These guys were at the top of the heap. And then most lately uh, what's happened is a whole new generation of machine has been developed called the ASIC miner. Uh, like companies by, like Bitmain are developing now computers that their specific purpose is simply to mine crypto. And this is, Bitcoin has fully gone to here, and Ethereum is here, and you know, most of them are in this area. Uh, now, again, I, I realize that today I'm gonna hit on a million different things, and, and feel free to invite me back and we can dig into some of these. This is an issue here that, about proof of work. In mining, in the creation of cryptocurrencies and in the securing of the network and this mining of these blocks, uh, there is a methodology called proof of work. And this, oh, whoops, and this whole thing, this, these machines, what they're doing is they're burning electricity, 
They're running a computational thing, and every now and then they get a little reward of a cryptocurrency. That's called proof of work, because there is actual work going on. There are machines, there's the burning of electricity, etc. It's kind of like if you mine gold. You know, gold doesn't just jump out of the ground. We gotta go dig, we gotta get trucks, we gotta, you know, do mines and you know, facilities. And so similar fashion, cryptocurrency is not created out of thin air. In essence, it's created out of electricity and a lot of computing power. And so that's proof of work. The world is changing from this model. One of the things that, that you'll get from me is that I'm, I, I may come off as kind of an anti-Bitcoin person, but the reason is because Bitcoin is first generation. It can't do what we need to do in the future. And Bitcoin is dedicated to this machine mining. And I don't think uh, it makes sense. As a miner, I think it's a grotesque use of computing resources. It's grotesque. We throw an enormous amount of computing power at a lottery. And the, the race is, is to build the machine that can do the most guesses in the lottery. It's crazy. Telling you guys. So there's a method that we're changing to for many of the blockchains now uh, are moving to a consensus method called proof of stake. You might think of it that in proof of work world, the machines have this, we call it hash power because they're computing a, a hash or they're trying to match it. Uh, the higher the hash power, the more the miners rewarded in the proof of work world. Uh, most of the blockchains and the cryptocurrencies you know of today are powered by this machine mining and that, that war from CPU over the specialized ASICs that we talked about. Uh, within these consensus algorithms is the core cryptographic uh, method being used. So within Bitcoin, uh, it's SHA-256, which is a pretty common uh, SHA-256 has been around for a long time, and so it worked perfectly well. And so when Satoshi wrote the white paper for Bitcoin, they just used SHA-256 as the, as the uh, algorithm. Ethereum uses a variant called KEKAC-256, similar to SHA-3. This is kind of what it gets to. Every one of these blockchains is running a different consensus algorithm, and at the heart of it is a different cryptographic engine. Some of them running, like I said, a lot of them run SHA-256. Bitcoin Cash, which forked off of Bitcoin, is of course a SHA-256 coin. And so, uh, as we move towards proof of stake, what's going on, and Ethereum is in the process of doing this, is they're saying, you know, this mining with these machines is not uh, sustainable. In fact, at some point, uh, if, uh, and there's different stories out there, but, you know, the electricity burned on the Bitcoin network can power a small country, right? We are using an enormous amount of electricity to power these blockchains. And it, like I said, it's a grotesque use of computing power. It's a grotesque use of resource, a scarce resource. Proof of stake basically says instead of mining based upon hash power, let's mine based upon what you have at stake. So it's a, it's a similar type of model, it's a similar type of algorithm, but my opportunity to mine the next block is based on how much money I put into the system, not how much hash power. So if I put in a million and you put in 100,000, I'm gonna have 10 times better chance of mining the next block than you. And so <coughs> putting the money at stake kind of, uh, in essence, puts that money into the network to be used. You know, kind of what kind of money are you putting in? Uh, real money or Bitcoin money? Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is the Bitcoin or whatever it is. Is it a, a block is only can be mined by one, one of the sites or one of the miner or? Yeah, each new block had to have been one, the right to mine it was won by one miner, one node. Now that node may have a thousand miners, like we all mine to a node called ethermine.org, and they probably have a thousand of us attached to them. Now they are competing with all our hash power to win that next block. So this, they the win next, about one out of ten. Is the next block a unique block, or can it come in different ways? It's always a unique set of, of uh, transactions. Everyone is trying to get, is the next block just 
the particular one, or can it happen to be something else? Uh, actually, so when somebody enters a transaction, I'll talk Bitcoin, it's kind of easy. So when somebody enters a transaction into Bitcoin, I want to send you uh, a Bitcoin. It goes into what's called the mempool, the memory pool. It's where transactions wait to get included in a block. And I can assign a fee to that. Like I'm willing to pay so much ether to have my transaction included in the next block. And if I put zero fee, I probably will never get put in the next block because the miners will pull the transactions in and they're offering to pay the highest fee. That's the other thing about blockchain. Everybody thinks it's like this libertarian thing, everything's free, you know, and all that. Not true. All these blockchains are really, their longevity is based on fees, transactional fees, fees to run code, fees to store data. So it's going to be a very fee-oriented world. That's already you know, kind of what we're having. Uh, I do want to, you know, one of the things I want to present to you today is, is a compelling argument that we are moving from Bitcoin and, and we're moving to a new set of blockchains and capabilities that really are the thing we ought to be building on in the near future. A lot of the uh, Ethereum is moving from its old mining on the machines, which used ETH hash, KECAC 256. They're moving to a proof of stake mechanism called Casper. And Casper's taken them several years to develop that. We're about to implement the very first steps of it. And we're probably gonna have Casper in, in I think, into 2019. Taking a lot longer than they thought. So it's, it's not ready yet. It's so not ready. This is an enormous developmental channel challenge. And one of the challenges is that Ethereum is an operational public blockchain. So it's become hard to make changes on a mechanism called Ouroboros, and I believe it is the most uh, academically robust uh, development of a proof of stake uh, mechanism in the world today. Uh, there's, a, there's one called EOS that's developed something called uh, Decentralized Proof of Stake, and uh, EOS was developed by a guy who started a, uh, a prior uh, social media blockchain called Steemit. Steam. Steam is the coin and Steam it is the site. And basically people can post articles and videos and things on Steam it and then if you like the article you give a little Steam coin to the author and this has become an enormous thing. Uh, and so the guy that developed Steam it now is creating a general purpose blockchain called EOS. And then I only threw this in to say there's a bunch of other things that people are doing. Uh, and they're coming out and saying, oh, we have a new thing, it's called proof of information. If the longest blah, blah, blah wins. Or, yes, there's a whole bunch of, of competition around proof of stake uh, consensus <coughs> algorithms. And that's what I was kind of telling you is that I think there's, this is a, a really interesting area of research, is consensus algorithms on these new generation blockchains. If I look at the world and how we got to where we are today, we go back to 2009, we had Bitcoin, simple ledger, multi-sig, gave us the cryptocurrency, uh, eliminated the double spin, everybody was happy, we had Bitcoin, it was cool. Uh, 2014, Ethereum, uh, one of the guys that was working on Bitcoin, went to them and said, hey, we should put code on the blockchain. Wouldn't it be cool if we could put smart contract code out on the blockchain and have it live out there? And the, block, the Bitcoin guys said, no way, Jose. We're not putting that stuff into our blockchain. And so Vitalik Buterin started Ethereum out of basically the frustration that the Bitcoin guys were not really interested in evolving that from anything but simple ledger. Simple, simple transactional ledger, which is what Bitcoin is. Uh, dedicated to proof of work. And the Bitcoin guys will tell you that proof of stake is garbage. It's not secure. It will never be secure. It can be attacked because there's no proof of the actual work that occurred. You know, and people could spoof that the work, you know. So there's this whole thing going on. But I really think this was the big, big step when we went from Bitcoin to Ethereum. Because what Ethereum, they really are a completely different idea of a blockchain. Ethereum's idea is to offer the world the Ethereum virtual machine. And on that virtual machine, I can store code. And that code can do things, conditional things. I could put a smart contract on Ethereum 
that pays somebody a hundred dollars of Ethereum a month for doing a job for me, and then maybe there's something that proves that he did the job. And so I could put that logic, that piece of code on Ethereum, and have it execute. <coughs> Sit there and execute. Every month it does something, or every time the, you know, I could put code on there that says every time the, you know, the temperature rises, do this. Kind of like so the, there's all kinds the, of the SETI grid computing kind of thing, where you SETI, you you heard of SETI, right? Yeah, yeah. Grid computing, where mm -hmm. basically you distribute jobs and people run the client. Yeah, it, but in this, in this, uh, this is all secure and containerized, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, it is very containerized, and but the interesting thing is that you still have this sequential blockchain. Except now, instead of just transactions like you give me, I give you, you give me, which is Bitcoin. Now we've got these code things in there that are saying, if this, then do that. Pay her if this happens. And so it is an interesting thing because that code, if you write a smart contract, that smart contract, once it's accepted into the Ethereum blockchain, it's then replicated into everybody's copy of the Ethereum blockchain. So not only are we storing transactions, but we're storing compiled code in the blockchain and it's doing something and we don't necessarily always know what it's doing and I think that's going to be one of our, our challenges but these guys really this is a completely different thing than this and that's kind of at the heart of what I'm telling you this is a virtual machine for running smart contracts and it's got a language called solidity that looks a lot like JavaScript and you know the only reason that these things have to have their own languages is they have their own kind of calls to services within the blockchain. Uh, in Bitcoin, they call them op codes. There's a whole bunch of op codes, and with those I can call it and have it, you know, the blockchain execute certain conditions or actions. Uh, and, and the other thing that these guys wanted was a Turing complete language, because all we've got over here is simple uh, scripting. And so uh, they, they did it intentionally. Again, simple scripting hard to build something that gets out of control and all it can do is just run a sequence. But over here we've got Turing complete code that can do all kinds of interesting uh, math that you can't do with scripting. What's a Turing complete language? Um, <coughs> you know, a Turing complete language, uh, and does anybody have a, a, an answer on it? Because I'm not necessarily, it can do the mathematical computations that are, uh, you I mean, can't do in a simple script. The Turing machine is the very most basic kind of computation machine. Yeah, but, but JavaScript or simple scripting doesn't give you the ability to do oh. some of the mathematics that you'd want to do in a smart contract. Everything goes to a finite state. Right. Isn't that what it think, essentially is? I think that's right. And and because the, there's a lot of issues with math and random numbers and things in JavaScript. So I'm just curious, I was looking here and it said, 80% of all Bitcoins are already produced. So is that why they're coming up with something new to get started back from zero and, you know? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, point is that over time there would be 21 million Bitcoins produced. There's been about 17 million made. Right. The next 4 million will be made probably over the next 15 years. Like, so. The reward of Bitcoin per block is going to be tiny, tiny fragments of Bitcoin, right? Um, and so it becomes harder and harder over time to produce a Bitcoin. More and more electricity, more and more computing power to do it. But it's still luck, right? Yeah. It's still like a lottery, but it's a fair lottery because it's based on your compute power. Is Bitcoin and a Bitcash the same? Like that's a good question. I didn't I didn't cover forks in this because we had so much to talk about already. But uh, one of the things about a decentralized blockchain like Bitcoin is that it's the code is open source. And so if us in the room decided we wanted to create, you know, Bitcoin UTA, all we got to do is go grab that code and basically create our, our own implementation of it. And so what happened when there's a disagreement? about the you know which direction to go in the case of bitcoin the block size was only one megabyte and that was what was in the white paper and it's kind of like a religion bitcoin's kind of like a religion the white paper said one megabyte it's got to be one megabyte some these guys wanted to do eight megabyte blocks instead of one megabyte blocks they couldn't agree on that so they forked bitcoin created a second one called bitcoin cash 
And in that one, they increased the block size to eight megabytes. They then have done some other things, implementing some cool opcodes and stuff. So basically some miners decided that on that day, we're going to switch to this version, this new version, and we're gonna put our hash power behind that. And it was very interesting. It happened in August of last year. I, I mean, I was watching it live, and uh, just how mining power, hash power moved from the old Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash. And uh, there's a there's a war going on in these block in this in this world, in that people are trying to win supremacy. And one of the ways they do it is they'll fork the coin because it's, I don't like the direction you're going. Litecoin came out of Bitcoin, but it was kind of everybody longest chain wins. Yeah, so it is like your power, your hash power is the largest in your, in the all, in the all world, then you will always claim you have the largest. So, I don't know if I got the, the exact question right, but uh, there is, the way you would attack this, for example, if, if you could get 51% of the hashing yeah. power, you could always decide what the next block is, you could win. Uh, you could game the system, yeah. so, so so it's an interesting. It's an inter There's a whole bunch of game theory that's deep inside of this consensus, and uh, it's fascinating. I, I don't have the intelligence to fully understand it, but it's, uh, uh, so the next question is, uh, I want the uh, hash power. It is from the compute, computer, like GPU or ASNIC. They are hardware. They have to manufacture, mm -hmm. right? They have real cost, right? But for that. We are this year entering into the kind of Gen 3 of blockchains. Mm -hmm. And what those are, are basically, people are calling them high performance blockchains or whatever. Well, let me just give you a little history. The guy that started Ethereum, he was trying to work on Bitcoin. He said, no way, go do your own thing. He did his own thing together with a guy named Charles Hoskinson, who's now started Cardano, because he's going to solve all the problems that these guys didn't solve. And because he doesn't have it running, he can solve these problems without upsetting a bunch of people, which is, there's a bunch of things already happening on Ethereum. There's also this EOS, which is uh, this guy, Dan Larimer, and Dan, uh, who started Steemit, one of the biggest blockchains and the biggest successes so far in blockchain. Uh, both these, whoops, both these guys uh, are trying to solve several problems. They want to bring that programmability of smart contracts and being able to put code into the blockchain. But they also want to solve this problem of scalability. Uh, it's one of my ending points that there are about, there's five problems I'm going to share with you. One of them is scalability. When you're doing this sequential building of a blockchain and everybody's got to keep a copy and it's trustless, so, uh, you know, I have to validate your transaction all the way back to the beginning of time. It's not scalable. Uh, blockchains in that fashion, Bitcoin and Ethereum as it is today, are not scalable. Uh, they can't do very many transactions per second. Uh, you know, they, they can't even compare to what Visa or even PayPal are doing transactions per second. So these guys are coming up with ways to kind of break the blockchain into parallel paths. Uh, that they call ethics on Cardano. Really, really interesting. Uh, the other issue that they're looking at is interoperability. You know, there's, I, I told you guys, it's kind of like a religion to a degree where there's Bitcoin people who are hardcore Bitcoin people and they think all oh, this is garbage. And really, they think the world only needed Bitcoin and that it really did solve the problem. Why are we doing all this stuff? You know? Well, these guys over here in this world assume there is going to be multiple blockchains. And those blockchains need to interoperate. And if you, if I'm on my blockchain and you want to send me Ethereum or Ether, I should be able from my blockchain to tap into the Ethereum blockchain and see if you have that Ether and make that transaction and come back to my blockchain and validate that that happened, right? It makes all the sense in the world. So there's this philosophical idea of, you know, one versus many. Many is going to win. Many always wins. The world has already moved here. Uh, and so I want to talk to you a lot about this, this level, this generation three, because if we're going to work on things in the future and the things that we learn here or develop would be relevant in three to five years, we need to be anticipating where this is headed and what that environment uh, will look like. 
Uh, in this world of programmability, I want to just talk a little bit about code. I am not a programmer. And so I'll tell you things that I know kind of anecdotally, but if you press me on how to code this or that, I will not be able to tell you how to do that. Uh, I, but I think I can make some pretty good points for you. Uh, the first is that this idea of programmability is storing contracts in the blockchain. Uh, storing contract logic, the ability to compile code and replicate that code to everybody's copy of the blockchain and then have that code live in the blockchain. Not on my server, not on anybody's server, it lives in Ethereum or EOS or Cardano or wherever it lives. Uh, each blockchain supports a different environment. Uh, what you will find if you work in this area is that each of these blockchains now have an SDK. If you're going to work on Ethereum, there's an Ethereum SDK. If you're going to work on Ethereum, they developed a special language for it called Solidity. Everybody hates Solidity, but you know it's the first attempt. I think it's an okay attempt. It's like JavaScript for a uh, blockchain. Um, but Turing complete. <laughs> They're working on a new uh, language called Viper. Uh, a lot of these, like EOS is basically just using C++, or uh, many of them you'll see will support you developing in almost any language. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing is that in this early programmable blockchain, it's like, I gotta go learn Solidity if I wanna do Ethereum. Why can't I do that? And, well, the reason you can't just do it in JavaScript or C++ is there's particular calls that need to be made or particular references that are not in part of that code base. So we have to have our own code base called Solidity. And so I think that's kind of problematic in that each, you know, you wanna go work on a blockchain, go learn a new language. It's gonna be similar to what you know, but still, it's kind of a hassle, right? To have to learn a new language just to work on a new project. It's like having to learn, you know, uh, SQL or, you know, Oracle or something in order to work on these blockchains. Um, decentralized applications are, you might think of it at a higher level. Uh, decentralized applications are an application that would use multiple smart contracts in presenting an application to the end user. So the end user is not going to be looking at a smart contract code, right? Uh, I mean, looking at that. They're going to be looking at some sort of interface. They're going to be doing some sort of activity like banking or trading or whatever, maybe on their smartphone. And that is one of the things I kind of want to talk to you about is what does that world, that architecture look like? Um, so dApps, you might think of, are kind of a collection of smart contracts. Make it simple. Um, so when I say smart contracts, it implies a contractual agreement between parties that executes, you know, maybe over time or whatever. I don't know why, you know, why do we need a smart contract. There's some sort of agreement that it's enforcing. But there's other types of logic that we can put into this code. Uh, and one of the things I'll, I'll show you in just a second is kind of what I'm uh, working on is really building an application. And to build an application, you have to still use a lot of the things that we use today, right? It's not blockchain. Uh, I've seen some crazy things, like people saying they, they're going to put AI on the blockchain or something like that. It doesn't even make, what does that even mean, what, to put AI on the blockchain? AI is not going to live on the blockchain, right? Maybe some, some elements of, of AI. But, so there's all kinds of crazy uh, use cases, but I, I, what I want to show you today is what I think is, is, is a, a logical set of use cases for this. Uh, the other thing I just threw in is that there's this idea of DAOs or de decentralized autonomous organizations. And literally these can be, the, the, it's like the set of rules that would uh, be applied that would normally maybe be applied by people or some sort of enforcement. Or, you know, we can now put behavioral regulations and things into code and then regulate how people behave or act through some sort of distributed autonomous organization without there being a central group of people. Um, that is a whole area for uh, thought, I think, that goes way outside of what we're talking about today. Um, this is what I'm most excited to, to tell you guys about because I think, as we think about blockchain, there's two things that are really important. 
uh, if you're going to build something on the blockchain, it should make sense that we use the blockchain, right? I've seen some really, really dumb ideas. Uh, I mentioned earlier the dent DentaCoin. I don't know why the dentists need their own blockchain, and I certainly don't know why they need their own coin, and why in the world did somebody put that on the blockchain? And guess what? It's one of the hottest coins on coin market cap last week. That's crazy. It's crazy. So I want to talk to you guys about real use cases. Obviously, automating and storing smart contracts that can execute over time based upon conditions is one of the biggest things that you can do with the blockchain. So anything that we're doing today through contract administration can be moved and automated into a blockchain. And the decentralization of things like banking or investment services or title services or insurance. You could literally set up an insurance company that is a distributed autonomous organization and everybody puts their contribution into it and when somebody has a claim, they get to pull money out of it and there is no insurance company, right? It's just a bunch of people who through a set of smart contracts agreed to pool their money and insure each other, right? We could literally eliminate banks, insurance companies, title companies, a lot of businesses could simply be automated away in, into the smart contracts. Um, so you can take commodity trading, stock trading, exchange, anything where we're exchanging value, easily move to the blockchain, right? Um, this is really kind of where I'm looking as a business opportunity is around the story on records. I spent my last 10 years uh, kind of doing internet-based real estate, um, into real estate. And, uh, I mean, how titles are stored, and, you know, and it just kind of gets me thinking about how we as individuals might use the blockchain to store our own information. Not through a company, but just us being able to store our own information. And uh, I'll expand on that a little bit. Uh, any sort of asset tracking or supply chain management uh, is going to move to the blockchain. So, uh, you know, and then conditional elements can be uh, applied, such as if something's moving through the blockchain, it might have a conditional element of, uh, say, uh, what was the temperature of the product uh, at different points in time? Did the temperature exceed a range? And if it exceeded a range, it's going to reject the product or whatever. So there's all kinds of conditional things that we could build into supply chain management, move those conditions, those contracts, and the movement of that value from one party to another. All it's going to move uh, into blockchain. Uh, I think this is a big area, digital rights management. If you think about where we are today, uh, you don't have to raise your hand, but uh, it's pretty easy to go get movies, music, things. It's unfortunate that for content creators, the world has not really figured out digital rights management. And it's really, uh, you know, the people that create content don't always get rewarded for their content if people can just replicate that content and give it away for free. And so I think the key management and things like that for access to content could move into the blockchain. So that maybe I buy a game but I buy it for a week and the key is good for a week and that you know it's validated against the blockchain and once that key expires, you know, you can't run the game anymore. Obviously we can do that with central servers. But the point is, you don't need a central server in this world. You can just put that condition out into the, into the public blockchain. Uh, voting in anonymous government. I think this idea of one, one, uh, eliminating the double spend problem, which we did with Bitcoin, uh, also addresses the problem of voting. Because we only can have one vote. One person, one vote. One person, one vote is going to move into the blockchain uh, voting, and, and that would enable all kinds of autonomous government models. For example, we could have a distributed, uh, decentralized autonomous organization, a government model, where we all vote in what we want done with our tax dollars, for example, and based upon our votes, you know, so many streets get fixed or so many other things get done. And it's all done through some sort of decentralized mechanism, right? Uh, control of personal data, I think, is interesting. You know, we've been looking at all this stuff with Facebook and people getting the data. And then the question is, you know, they know a lot of data about us and we don't control that data, you know? And so they're trying to do some things like, oh, now you can see what data we have on you. You can decide if it's shared or not. 
Well, that's a centralized organization that is collecting your data. And, oh, well, thank you, Facebook. You're now going to let me have a little bit of control over my own data. Well, I think in the future, a lot of that data uh, about us will be stored in ways in the blockchain in ways that we can enable or disable the ability to use information about us. And also things like rewards and loyalty points. You know, we got all those little things on our keychain. We go into Kroger's or wherever and we show them a little barcode. It's so archaic, you know. And so I think a lot of that stuff is going to move into the blockchain. <clears throat> and our people are looking at, like, well, you know, maybe I get reward points from my company uh, and I want to take those reward points from American Airlines and trade them for Starbucks points. And that guy really wants to fly on an airplane. I really want to get a good deal of coffee. And we trade our Starbucks points for our American Airlines points. And those are simple uh, cryptocurrencies that maybe have a, a purpose. Like, I can see the purpose behind things like that. Uh, for the most part, I think you could transact using, you know, Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, any of the main coins. You don't really need dental coins. Uh, also, I think decentralized model for uh, Facebook uh, or social media and marketplaces. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the world right now to decentralize social media. The thought is that YouTube, because I watch a lot of a lot of my learning these days, guys, comes from YouTube. Because every day. There are guys that I follow that every day are talking about what's happened in blockchain today. And the fact of the matter is YouTube can decide who gets monetized and who doesn't get monetized. You can be making $10,000 a month on YouTube because you're super popular and got a lot of followers. And they can decide to demonetize your channel. Take you $1,000 a month. Stop putting ads on your... The centralized organization, you're using their stuff. We're not paying to put stuff on YouTube, right? It's free. There's a price for that. The price for that is they control it. They control who sees it. They control whether we monetize it. So all that can be moved into uh, a blockchain type of world where there is no Facebook. There is no YouTube. There's no eBay or Craigslist. But what is a Craigslist, right? We're just putting some records out there. People can view the records. You know, once I sell the bike, I should take the record down. You know, simple, simple stuff. I still don't get Craigslist the business model. It's I mean, been around uh, for 30 years. All, all, this, all this, all uh, these ideas are well and good, but you still have to have the hardware somewhere, and ordinary people probably cannot buy that kind of hardware. Well, I think for many of these things, they are a systems development activity, except. Realize that in this world, the hardware is the blockchain. The, the blockchain is the virtual machine. We're deploying apps. We, we take an SDK, we use Solidity, and we build smart contracts, and we push them out into Ethereum, and they work out there. And all my only computers were my development machines, where I created the code, I ran it on the test net, made sure it worked. Once it worked, I'm pushing it out onto the Ethereum virtual machine. And then it and lives and runs in the blockchain. Pushing right? things to Ethereum doesn't cost anything? It does cost. Every time we put code into Ethereum, every time we make a call to get information out of it, every time we want to make a transaction, in Ethereum we're charged a little bit of Ether. They call it gas. Literally call it gas. <laughs> and a couple, a couple of blockchains call their fees gas. And I think that's one of the, so like the EOS platform, he's saying, oh, my platform, you'll be able to store your smart contracts and your data. No fees, no fees. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because I think ultimately the nodes are the computers. And the only reason these guys are running these machines, these nodes, is because they're getting rewarded for mining the blocks, right? right? So in order to pay something in, in the virtual currency, You'd have to have mined something and owned it already, right? So the only person who'd be able to use the app would be those who have some virtual currency, or do they? Uh, have to it is definitely the case that, like or, today, or country, rather paper currency. Today, if, if I want to develop an app on Ethereum, a smart contract, I build it uh, locally on my machine. I run it on the test net, and then uh, when I push it out, I will have to pay a certain amount of gas to get it replicated out onto the 
where, public where, where, guess, where would you get that gas from? So now, you would get it from, so so I do have to have, an, you know, in essence, an Ether address that has Ether. Or will they give you gas credits? And started. Well, so today, you know, the way we take dollars and turn them to Ethereum is we send those dollars to Coinbase, uh, which is an uh, uh, exchange that's a uh, venture capital funded San Francisco company, Coinbase, huge. Uh, really going to be one of the big players, but they're a centralized exchange. Just like a money changer. Yeah, they'll take your oh. dollars, sell oh. it into the market for Ether, give you the Ether, so, give that guy so the So that's dollars. how you change the virtual to kind of standard. Yeah. I don't want to see the Ether card. Yeah. It's not and then the once I have Ether or Bitcoin, I think can then go to other exchanges and trade for other coins now using the Bitcoin instead of So money. how many exchanges are there? There are many of them. Uh, awesome. you know, the two that I think are the, the winners are Coinbase and a company called Binance. Binance is huge and Binance has a lot of coins where Coinbase only has like five. It's a very restricted, you know, it's like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, Ether, and maybe Ripple, something like that. Um, this is a conceptual architecture. I kind of want to talk to you about this problem that I'm trying to solve. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. Um, is Open Bazaar a kind of a decentralized marketplace or a new type of e-commerce? What is it exactly? Is what? Open Bazaar. I don't know what that is. It's a decentralized marketplace. It is? Yeah, you can think of it just like Amazon or eBay. Okay. But there's no middleman involved. Hmm? But there's no middleman involved. Uh, no. Yeah. That's a good example. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, I, I think they don't have any white paper already. But you can ask them probably. Ways I look at it is I want to create an app called Prop Blocks. And what Prop Blocks will do is it will simply give me or you the ability to store information about things that we own out onto the blockchain. So if I buy a new lawnmower, I can take a picture of the receipt, I can take a picture of the barcode on the lawnmower, both those things get read, uploaded into the blockchain, it gets created as a property token for my lawnmower, and I now uh, have a little property token, and that property token is tethered to my lawnmower. So that if I lose, if it gets stolen, I can go pull it up, look at it, I have all the information, if it needs warranty work, I have all the information. You know, so I had this idea that anything I own, particularly those things that I buy and they got barcodes or serial numbers or whatever, I should be able to take my smartphone, take a picture of that and create a token just for that item. And then I could hold those in my property wallet or property vault. And then if I ever sold the lawnmower to my neighbor, uh, he could pay me in regular money or crypto money and then I could send the token for the lawnmower to him and he would have the full history of it. I use the lawnmower because it's kind of a simplified kind of dumb idea, but my real idea is to store property deeds, vehicle registrations, and things like that. That is going to be a slow world to change, right? And so the way I want to come at it is to say, I'll just give people the ability to store records of anything they own on my blockchain. I don't care what it is. They can store the property information. They can store their car information. They can store information about the computers they bought. They can store everything that's really important to them. That information could just be stored out there. And each <coughs> product that you register is a property token. That's my basic idea. There's still some point where somebody's going to want a physical copy. Yeah, yeah. And so I, but I don't want to get too deep into the idea okay. or the merits of the idea. The, the point I wanted to make is that as I think about building this, it employs an architecture that is not just blockchain. And I think a lot of people think blockchain is going to, you know, if you don't know blockchain, you know, you're dead because we're not doing web anymore. We're not doing web services. We're not doing JavaScript anymore. It's a whole new world. You've got to go learn all new languages. You've got to do all this stuff new. All those old apps no good anymore. Well, the reality is it's going to look more like this. I think what we know from the, the work I'm doing today in real estate and uh, internet-based services is now 65 to 70 percent of our interactions with our website are through these things. Okay, so the world is now, they're not using the desktops. Yeah, we still use the laptops and the tablets, but the reality is we use this the most because we have it all the time. And so 
I started to think about this and its ability to see, and if I can take a picture of, say, my property deed or something like that, I can then read that information off that, uh, that thing that I took the picture of. It's really easy to read what's in a picture. And so the idea I had was, hey, why don't I have this smartphone app? I can take a picture of a receipt and take a picture of a barcode and take a picture of a product and then all that gets uploaded, read into a record and stored, and I now have a property token for my laptop. I now have a property token for my car, or whatever it is. And that was the basic idea. But it, it started with the ability to use this to capture real world information and get it into the blockchain, right? Uh, I also need uh, the ability to access anything I'm gonna do through a website. It's not just about smartphones. We know that about 30% of our activity still comes through a website. Um, I want the ability, if I already have a document, say I was given, I just bought a new house, I was given all that paperwork in a PDF, very common now. I take the PDF, I wanna be able to upload the PDF into the service so that I can easily take, this is the information that proves that I bought that property. Now the county's gonna have it, that's cool, but they have it for their purposes. What do I do with it? Well, I can put it in a file and stick it in a file case and maybe in a drawer and you know, maybe if I ever have to prove something, I'll go get that paperwork back out of that drawer. Well, the idea here is, well, I just take the PDF and upload it. And then if the paper gets destroyed, it doesn't matter. I still have it. One of my original ideas for this came from a conversation I had with a guy who lived, and I don't wanna get political, but he lived in a country where other people came and took away their property. And all of a sudden, his home that they had had for 40 years was not their home anymore. They went to live at their grandfather's house. A couple of years go by, this settlement thing is expanding, and all of a sudden, they're told they don't own their grandfather's house anymore. And, you know, and I just thought, you know, a government, a new government, somebody can come in, and they can go to the county, and they can just destroy all those records, and they say, hey, I don't care what you had in the past. You don't have it now. And one of my thoughts was that I want to be able to store in the blockchain the evidence of everything and make it digital and store it in the blockchain and nobody can destroy it, nobody can get it. Now later on they may tell me I don't own it, but I will have the evidence that I did own it. And so I, as I thought about this, if I buy something on uh, Amazon, I want that receipt to be sent directly into this app and create a token for anything I buy over $500. I just want that to be stored in my property wallet on the blockchain. So anything's worth over $200 or $500 worth. I want that email from Amazon to go straight here, be read straight in and stored into, into the database. But if you start thinking about designing these kinds of things in the world we live in today, we have a lot of things available to us like web services where we don't write code anymore to do payments. You know, we just basically API to a thing that knows how to do that. And so the world will still use a lot of these web services and still uses a lot of databases. Because one of the questions I had uh, asked a lot is, doesn't the blockchain get really big and cumbersome if we store everything on it, right? We can't put movies on the blockchain, right? It makes no sense to put movies on the blockchain. The keys that control the access to the movies may be on the blockchain, but the movie's gonna be over here in some database somewhere, right? And so, the other concept that uh, I've been working on is the concept of sidechain. And this is something I think that you guys should think about if you have interest in blockchain. Is that in 30 minutes, you can go grab the code and execute the code to create your own blockchain. It's not that hard, really. Uh, now, if you wanted to build a full you know, network, but no, you'd have to get other people to want to run nodes and stuff, but just to write and run a blockchain, you can do uh, very easily. You can do it with JavaScript, you can do it with a bunch of different approaches. But let's just say, I can write, I can write a side chain, and that side chain has a higher degree of interactivity with these services, and might store some more data than I would put on the main chain. Because remember what we were talking about, if every time I talk to the main chain, I incur a fee, right? And so I don't want to occur, incur a fee. And in my model here, the idea is that I take a physical object, 
We capture information about that physical object, we create a token for it, and then what we're storing on the main chain is simply the history of the pair of your ID with your product. Like, so your one ID of you might be matched to 20 product IDs, and those, those pairs are all I really want to store over here. I want an immutable history of you owning those things on a blockchain that cannot be broken. And so on my side chain, I may do certain tasks. The distributed application really conceptually lives on what I do with my side chain and what I do with the main chain. And this is, this is what I think the architecture of blockchain apps are gonna look like. Now, some people may just have apps that talk directly to Ethereum, directly to EOS, directly to whatever. But I think the application of a side chain is really a brilliant idea because it addresses things, a lot of these scalability issues and fee issues and just the fact that I may want to store things uh, kind of more locally. This is not necessarily a decentralized blockchain. This is my blockchain, right? But it periodically mirrors its state to the public blockchain. And that state may be any deltas between what I told it last time and now. So that if I uh, bought the laptop and you gave me the token for your laptop and I now put it in, so now the owner of the laptop ID has changed. So the delta has occurred. That's all I really want to ultimately tell this thing. Because if all this got destroyed, I would still have an immutable record of these key pairs and oh well, hopefully if all we got straight, it wouldn't be of any value. But, uh, you get up, the up to the last update. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think it's funny because one of the things you asked me question at the beginning is, I believe it was you, but I mean, maybe it was you that said, isn't this kind of like a data storage thing? And, and to me, sort of, yeah, I mean, I think you can put entire code Watch. applications that run over here but the question is, do they need to be there? Is there a reason that we need to put code all the way out onto the public chain? Or shouldn't a lot of that code live within the user kind of side of what this thing does? We need user interface, we need smartphone, we need web, we need all that stuff that we still have today. But in the back end, it's talking to blockchains. These users will never know or care about this. And the only reason we will be able to or care about it is, or the reason we'll care about it is that we can now offer that kind of immutability, that decentralized storage. You now own your own records. You now own your own money. You now own your own everything, right? And that's kind of the idea that's enabled by the blockchain on the back end. Uh, I, have, I have one question. So for centralized data centers, I have a problem that the manager of the, the the administrator will wouldn't remove your data, right? But uh, who will always maintain the management the night You know, I, I do think I think you're 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 pointing out an issue. I think one of the issues is if this is decentralized, there's no administrator yeah. and we can all push stuff out <laughs> onto it. One issue might be over time there's gonna be a lot of dead code out here. Because who's Who's maintaining it? Who cares? Who says this smart contract that everybody's maintaining a copy of has effectively played out and doesn't need to be on the blockchain anymore? Right. So if you want to copy, keep up one copy. But, but the other thing, if you think about it, that's just conceptually an issue is that each block that's added is immutable. So if that smart contract existed here, it always exists here. Yeah. And so, even if you kind of later came back and killed the smart contract, historically it still exists because the history is immutable. You don't go back and you change can, this. You can put a change, cancel contract. And yeah, and, and you will. You will. In fact, what, what I'm seeing on a development That's front, what the, some of the transactions do. They can do something. Like that, they can put a compensating record, it's called. Mm -hmm. I think if you call it one minute, one minute. Insanity to put code or data into the blockchain. It's like, for them, it's just simple transactions. Yeah. Right? 
And so that, that conceptually, if you stay in that world, it's simpler. It's easier. You don't have all these conflicts. You don't have to deal with all these problems. But the world has now moved. You know, Ethereum said, no, this is like a virtual machine. We want to run code on this thing. And then now we've moved to stage three where these guys are saying, not only are we going to want to run code, but we want to do like all kinds of things to address scalability and interoperability. And yeah, so you should just be storing a hash of, of the object in the, in the blockchain. Yeah. See, and that, that's what, that's even like my, my thought here. So you give me a PDF and it's the PDF of your property deed. And so I can read that in probably through a web service and then store maybe the PDF here and then store a compressed version of it here and store simply a hash of it here that I could backwards, you know, work that this the hash issue, represents. The issue with this. storage, when you store a lot of things anywhere, is how do you find them later? <laughs> See, is the, I, I think is the real you world... need to find them, how yeah. do you find them? So I think in the, the real world, that when you, sometimes you hear blockchain people, they say, we're moving from the old world to the new world. The old world was centralized, the new world is decentralized, right? I don't buy that as the real world, because the real world will combine centralized application components with decentralized blockchains. And, in case, and it may actually make calls to multiple blockchains. So I took, gave you the example earlier. I'm running something, let's say I've got a transactional process here so we can actually, you can actually sell me your laptop through my service, right? And I want to take, uh, and you want to pay me an Ether, I should be able to connect over to Ethereum, do that transaction like it's PayPal, get the confirmation and come back here and give you the title to the laptop, right? Or give me the title, we swapped it, right? And so I think um, the real world is gonna look a lot like this world, except we're adding these capabilities, I think, of main chains and side chains. And side, the idea of side chain is relatively new. It's an area I'd like to do research in and kind of figure out what can we do with a side chain to then minimize our, our activity with the main chain. But the reason we need the main chain is we need it for that immutable history that it creates over time that we can't create with our own model. Um, the, my last two slides, are, these are the hard, hard problems. Like, uh, I, I was thinking, you know, when people are giving me a talk, I often feel like they're selling me something, you know? And when, when I, if I'm trying to sell you blockchain, I'm not going to mention the problems because I want you to buy this blockchain thing, right? Well, I'm not selling you blockchain. We're here to learn and I'm trying to learn. And as I've been learning about this, I have stumbled upon some very big elephants in the room. And the first two are the scalability issue and, and the interoperability issue. Scalability. That sequential blockchain model is not scalable. That one megabyte constraint <coughs> on the Bitcoin block, that does not scale. I mean, you can do the math. It, you cannot fit all the transactions of the world into one block every 10 minutes on Bitcoin. It doesn't work mathematically, right? It's 150 gig now, the ledger. For, for 100, 150 gig. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, woo -woo. Uh, this is a huge issue, and proof of stake, moving from the machine mining to the kind of logical or money mining, or whatever you want to call that, mining with stake. A proof of stake does not address scalability. It's just a different way of managing consensus on you know, which block gets mined, who gets to mine. Uh, there needs to be other methods, such, uh, and what they're working on, Ethereum is working on sharding, which is really a concept that goes back to you know database uh, management and sharding really kind of takes the chain and maybe breaks it into smaller pieces where I don't have to have the whole Ethereum blockchain on here, but I might have the last three days of it, or something like that. But you know, so there's some sort of uh, segmentation or breaking up so that we can. Uh, run it without running the entire blockchain. I think that's one of the key issues. Um, in uh, Cardano, they're addressing scalability with this really, I, I think it looks like parallel processing. It's almost like 
if you had, if everything was a sequential process, and all of a sudden you took that and you could break it up into lanes, and they call them epics, or yeah, they break them up into lanes, and then within the lanes there are time epics that occur, and it is fascinating. I mean, if you're if you're into this kind of like, because a lot of this is kind of built around game theory and how, you know, how people behave, to be honest. And so this, uh, there's different game theories around how you kind of take this sequential process and break it up into a more of a parallelized process. Uh, I think that's going to be solved. It will not be solved by Bitcoin. Um, and Ethereum is solving it with sharding. I think Ethereum will become a third gen blockchain when they move to proof of stake and they implement sharding to deal with scalability. Uh, and I think if you look at Cardano, you'll see a very elegant uh, solution to this. Uh, so uh, one, uh, once a record is uh, stored on the blockchain, it will uh, never get obsolete. I mean, it will always be used uh, in future. Uh, we, we can't say that this block uh, will uh, now won't be used again in the computation. Well, remember, a I, I hope I, I get your question right, but a block is a collection of transactions that occurred in a period of time. And then subsequently, like if I want to figure out how much Bitcoin I have, I can go back all the way to the beginning and see how much, was, how much did I give, how much did I get, and compute how much I have. And so every one of those prior blocks will always be exactly as they are. They're immutable. They cannot change because it would break that, you know, that, uh, uh, that calculation, that hash that was occurring that secures each block to the next one and the prior one. Um, in interoperability, I think the two things that are going to happen here are that there's a lot of guys working right now on getting blockchains to talk to one another and how you interface with blockchains. Looks a lot like APIs, to be honest. Right, you're making a call to something, a service, that call needs a certain format, you're gonna get an answer back in a certain format, you know, it's this kind of communication layer that we had to implement, uh, you know, to really do web services. Um, blockchains do not speak well to legacy systems. You were talking about earlier, how do I turn a dollar into, you know, a dollar's worth of Bitcoin? It's not that easy, and there's only a few avenues that we can go through to convert our fiat currency into cryptocurrency, like Coinbase. I mean, it's literally in the US, it's Coinbase, and I think there's one other, but I'm blanking on it. They're the big one. But the problem is legacy systems see these blockchains almost like viruses. Because in a legacy world, we need to care about a lot of things like anti-money laundering. KYC means know your customer. You have to have data about the transaction. If you look in Bitcoin, all we see is so much Bitcoin was sent from address one to address two, and that's the transaction, right? There's a tiny bit of additional data you could store in a transaction, but it's like minuscule, right? Uh, that doesn't work in the world of banking. If I, if, if I do an initial coin offer, offering and I raise $20 million and I convert that to fiat and I go put that fiat $20 million in my bank because I want to pay you guys to develop my project, uh, the bank's going to say, where in the world did you get this $20 million? And I'll say, well, I got it from uh, investors. <laughs> where? Off the internet. I say, who are they? Hell, I don't know. <laughs> I just get to send me a bunch of money. That doesn't fly in the banking world, you know, because like in, in, in investments, uh, we, we want to know, if in some cases, are you uh, an accredited investor? Do you have enough money to be making this risky investment? Because in America, we try to protect dumb people from making bad decisions, right? And so we say, if you got uh, a bunch of money, then yeah, you can buy this risky thing. And so. That whole area of compliance, the storage of data about the data, you know, the metadata about transactions, and attribution, right? In the banking world, we know that the dollar was here, the dollar was given to me, the dollar was given to you, and the dollar was given to you, and we can attribute the flow of those dollars. And the, you can do that in the blockchain world as well, because the whole blockchain is visible, and we can see, that's one of the things I could, I give you my address, you send me 
uh, half Bitcoin, you now can go on Block Explorer, blockchain.info, put in my address, and see exactly how much Bitcoin I have. You can see every transaction I ever made. But not who you really are. But not who I am. You're seeing any other than. But once I tell you who I am by giving you a public key, you can now use that public key to learn a lot about me, right? So some of the issues they're trying to solve in blockchain is, this, is that, uh, what they call zero knowledge. They want to be able to do transactions and verify that you have something without giving your entire history or making it available. You know, you should be able to validate something without exposing everything. And I think uh, zero knowledge proofs and this thing called ZK snarks, they're developing ways to kind of it's almost the opposite of the banking world. In the banking world, we want a lot of information about the transaction, and a lot of information about you, and you, and so we want to know all that stuff. Over here in the blockchain world, we don't want to know anything. It's libertarian, we're just free, you know, and we're just sharing, and it's just a wonderful world, right? Those two don't work together. So so they have to work together. You've got to bridge legacy systems to blockchains or blockchains will never be able to have any major impact in the real world, right? Your identity is a private key for right now in the blockchain? Your identity really is, and I, that's, you're very good at setting me up for my next point, because this issue is, I think, the biggest issue that exists. I always I often say about blockchain, there is no Bank of America. Right? You got a problem? You know, you lost your money? Sorry. Who are you going to call? <laughs> you know, there is no Bank of America, right? So the problem in, in this world is that our identities and credentials are owned only by us, and they're represented by public and private key pairs, right? And so here's the problem. The maintenance of these private keys is not user friendly. That on, in, in the blockchain world, you hear people say, I, I, I got my cryptocurrency in a wallet. You don't have anything in a wallet but these keys. That's all you have in the wallet. And you can store those keys online where they can get stolen. And so you might get all your money. Or you can actually take those keys offline and store them on a little USB stick or something, you know. And now I got my keys in my wallet, right? And that's how I'm securing it. And guess what? I lose that little thing. Where's my money? How do I get back to my money? I, if I lose my private key, I can never get back. Now, with these physical wallets, they'll have uh, things like, uh, I forgot what they call them, but it's like 20 words. It's a recovery, it's a recovery phrase, but it's basically like 20 random words. And the idea is that you put all your private keys down this little thing, and then you secured it with your private key, but you also created uh, this, these 20 words. And if you, and you write them down, and you put them in a safe place, and if you ever forget your private key, you can recover it, <coughs> 20 words in that sequence, that's your recovery phrase, right? That is a nightmare. Can you imagine most, your mom or dad or uncle or brother, or, the people you work with having to deal with owning their own keys and figure out whether they're exposed on the internet or I put them on this little doodad, where's that thing, what happens now, how does this work, I don't know. It's kind of like crazy. And then all these services use two-factor authentication, so you have to have Google Authenticator running right here. If you want to talk to Coinbase, they're going to authenticate you. Guys, that's a pretty technical world, right? If you think about it, this isn't like Bank of America, right? Where I just go to the ATM and I look, you know, take a picture of the check and it goes in my account. And it's pretty cool stuff. Centralized service, right? In this world, I gotta maintain my own stuff. And here's kind of one of the big problems I think about. When you lose your private keys, you lose whatever you had. We're talking about money when we talk about cryptocurrency or what if it's your medical records? What if it's your property deeds? What if we get moved all the way to a world where you maintain your own stuff? There's no county anymore. There's no county office that has the deeds. Everybody keeps their own deeds on the blockchain. If there's ever a question, you just pull it up. Show them your deed, right? What if you can't do that, you know? Now, obviously, I think the world, I always think the world, 
people envision it going all the way to something new. And reality is we kind of move towards that something new. And one of the reasons I'm not trying to go get counties to put property deed information on my blockchain is that's not a business I want to be. I don't want to be a data backup service for the county. What I want to give is individual users the ability to store their own information. But that burden that comes with that is if I give you the ability to store everything you own, information about everything you own on my blockchain, and then you lose your credentials, there's not much I can do for you at that point. Sorry. If it gets hacked, you know, if you lose something, if you check, if you go into Coinbase and your money's gone, you could probably see the address that that money went to and then see the address that that went to, but guess what you don't know who those people are? You lost your money. It's gone. And so this is a world that's very, uh, you know, you can have a very abrupt end <laughs> to some of these things. You're, you're using the service and it's great, and all of a sudden you lose your credentials and you find there is nobody to call to recover that. It's so, going to be a huge problem. Uh, theoretically, as time goes, the chain will be a, become a dead one. I think there will be a lot of, there, there is millions of dollars, who knows if it's billions, of Bitcoin that will never be recovered because the private keys were lost. We have to assume that some percentage of the cryptocurrency in a blockchain has been lost to the loss of the private keys. I think we're kind of running out of time here. Okay. Wow, we talked for a long time. Uh, my last slide. Uh, Auditability is an issue. Uh, these smart contracts, you put them on these blockchains, you're really writing them in some language that gets compiled to run on the blockchain, and then these objects do things, and you can't easily look at these objects and see what it does, because it's a, it's a blob of compiled code. And there's been mechanisms to kind of back it back out, you know, uncompile, this compiled object to try to see what the logic is inside the object. But I think that's, that's an, uh, an issue. And it really gets at that other point that we were talking about, that there'll just be code that's kind of abandoned out there onto the blockchain. It doesn't do anything anymore. Maybe it did its job, and then you know maybe it's no longer repeated in the new blocks, but forever it kind of exists in the prior blocks. Um, how do we know if our agreements are properly captured in these smart contracts? I think that's one of the issues, is that uh, three of us in here can come up with some complex agreement, and we can implement that in a smart contract, so that based upon certain conditions, I pay you or you pay me or whatever. But at some point, we're going to give our agreement to a coder, and the coder's going to code that and say, okay, here's your smart contract. And how do you really know that that smart contract does the things that your agreement uh, said. There are definitely uh, mechanisms uh, to deal with this and uh, ways that, uh, today, a lot of these smart contracts go through an audit step. And the audit step is a code review, and they look at the logic and compare it to the original thing. And then there are literally auditors now that are auditing smart contracts. The other thing I think that's interesting about Cardano is Cardano's claim to fame is that they've implemented their blockchain using Haskell, which is a formal, uh, functional programming language that can enable more formal valid, uh, formal verification steps. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that there's no ability to rewind or undo. Like when, so if I send you a Bitcoin by accident, let's say I'm supposed to send you 0.1 Bitcoin, I accidentally send you 1.0 Bitcoin. That's a problem, right? Now I know you because we did a transaction, but now instead of sending you, you know, a thousand dollars, I actually sent you ten thousand dollars, right? And so I call you on the phone and say, "Hey, I made a mistake. It's supposed to be point one. I sent one point." And you say, "Who's this? I don't, what? I don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> like it's very hard. There's no undo button, right? No, but there's, there's standard ways to do that. You just put a new contract that undoes the old one. So yeah, but. He has to agree to it. He has to agree right. to it. He has to agree. Yeah, so I think th yeah, there's a fine, there is a... If they don't, then it's uh, That's the problem. Yeah. yeah, there is a finality to these things, right? When something moves from point A to point B, there's a degree of finality because it's in the blockchain and I mean, it has it's happened. The same right? thing with the regular contract. If you yeah. sign it, you can't undo it unless the other guy agrees yeah. to it, right? 
And so uh, that's really my talk. I want to just quickly tell you guys, uh, these are resources that I am looking to and learning from. And I, I particularly want to tell you guys oops, about this guy, Ivan on tech. Have any of you heard of him? He's a YouTuber. Right. The guy was a coder, he started getting into blockchain, started doing educational stuff. And he now has uh, two courses out on the, this one exists already, Blockchain Fundamentals. If you go to academy.ivanontech.com, you'll be blown away by the amount of technical content that they have in an inexpensive course. And then in June, they're starting a smart contract coding course at coding.ivanontech.com. I watch this guy religiously. I watch him every, does it, every day show on blockchain, has guests, top, top uh, YouTuber guy. But the amount of content is in here, literally as far as looking at building some sort of curriculum around blockchain, man, I would look right into these things because he has built an amazing curriculum for that full technical side of blockchain. Stuff I can't teach you is really right uh, in those two locations. The other thing is that all these guys, Ethereum, Cardano, and EOS are the kind of the ones that I uh, mentioned today. There are obviously other blockchain projects, NEO, NIM, Nano, IOTA, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I think there will be a pairing down in the next couple of years. Like these things blew up. There's over a thousand of them. A lot of them are based on Ethereum, by the way. I think there'll be a pairing down and we'll get to some reasonable number of these things. But I, these guys will be winners because the, uh, Cardano and EOS are in the top 10 coin zone. Is Cardano world. a system name or a person's name? Cardano is the blockchain uh, and it is in a testnet right now and goes li the blockchain goes live in, I think, in June. And so that's it. The Cardano and EOS are brand new blockchains that are implementing and going live this year, like this summer. Uh, Ethereum's been around for about four or five years. And so it's the, it's kind of the, if you think of Bitcoin, it's kind of the genesis of all this. Ethereum then took the blockchain and added logic to it. And then now in stage three, these guys are trying to deal with scalability, interoperability, and a lot of these big problems. And I think at the end of the day, our solutions may use multiple blockchains, side chains, traditional elements like web and database and things like that. So a lot of the things that we've been learning about and doing the last few years are just as relevant in the future. But what we've added is this very powerful uh, capability with the blockchain. Decentralization, immutability, trustless. It's a you know, pretty fascinating uh, evolution uh, for data and for IT. So I hope that was it was a lot. It was a long talk, wasn't it? Yeah. I just told you about all the world's religions in two hours or something like that. Thank you. I, I, Thank I hope you. that was helpful. Questions. Any questions? Any more questions? <laughs> hey, I'm going to leave you with, with this and that. In the dot com era, because I came from, you know, I went through the whole dot com thing, right? There were some stupid ideas. Like, everybody was so excited about dot com. If you stuck dot com on the end of something, somebody would fund your idea. The dot com era was characterized by a bunch of stupid ideas. And I think we as, as system architects, as creators, as developers, we are kind of the gatekeeper to make sure we don't invest our time in stupid ideas. And I think in blockchain, we're seeing a lot of stupid ideas. Those 1,400 coins, about 1,200 of them are just ridiculous. There's no use case. There's no reason to have a cryptocurrency. Every one of them has a development team. Every one of them now has to maintain that development project. And so I think we want to make sure that we, we don't fall into this idea that people think everything's going to be put on the blockchain. We're going to put movies on the blockchain. No, we're not. I mean, that makes no sense, you know. We're going to have a blockchain just for dentists, or just for physicians, or just for veterinarians. That makes no sense. Why do we need that? I mean, tell me why we need that. And so I think 
you guys as developers in, in, in the next couple of few years as you have opportunities to work on this, value your time uh, and say, you know, this is a, I'm not gonna put my time into this. It's not a good idea. The use case needs to make sense. It's all about the use case. Everything that we do is about the use case. Uh, use, use them to improve processes and end user, for end users that we can show that it used to take this long, it now takes this long. And for example, maybe a, a supply chain management process where we used to not know until after it happened what happened, but now we can see what happens you know, every 10 seconds or something. So there's some really significant change that occurs in the process because we used uh, the technology. And every, I always say everything that we've learned so far is very, very valuable in this new world. And uh, it doesn't go away. We just add this uh, blockchain element to what we're building. Other questions? So is the Coinbase which determines the valuation of a Bitcoin or Ether, for that matter, anything, is it Coinbase or some other financial institution? It, it, it literally is a market. Coinbase is a market maker. So they run a service that allows that bidding and asking between buyers and sellers. And you can literally, if you go into, uh, Coinbase has a sister service called GDAX, GDAX.com. If you go to GDAX, you can watch the bid ask process live and you can kind of see if there's a bunch of people trying to sell or a bunch of people trying to buy. And it's really fascinating to see it in real time. But it's a real time marketplace, it's a global marketplace. Uh, they do maintain their own exchange and so that's one of the weird things is that if you go look at another exchange like BitThumb, which is in South Korea, they will have very different prices for the same thing. Uh, in South Korea, they, they love crypto and they'll pay 10, 20% more for a Bitcoin than you would on Coinbase. So you see this weird thing and then people are trying to arbitrage it. Like I'm gonna buy the Bitcoin over here on Coinbase and I'm gonna sell it over here on BitThumb and I'm gonna arbitrage, you know. But it, so there are multiple exchanges. There's no one price for Bitcoin. It's really determined by the, the activity that's going on at the individual exchanges. And now, what the other thing that's going on with exchanges is today there is a Coinbase. It's kind of like Bank of America, right? You have an account. If you have a problem, you can call them. They're a customer service, right? The idea is that exchanges could be completely decentralized to where there is no Coinbase. And if I have an asset, I can put that asset in the exchange, and a buyer can be found, and it's really the smart contracts and the logic, and maybe this distributed organization that becomes Coinbase. So I don't really need a Coinbase. In this world, I need a Coinbase. In the future, I may not. But I do think one of the things that Coinbase helps with is that whole key management deal, because I don't know my private key with Coinbase. I put in a password, and I do two-factor authentication, and then they unlock my private key. So they, that's, that's a big area, that whole key management thing. Uh, we have the uh, traditional currency, like the uh, US dollars. So we, uh, we can't transfer that through internet. Uh, we, I mean, we have wallets which store that. And uh, we, we can transfer that currency from one wallet to another. So what, what does Bitcoin solve? Well, in the, in the Bitcoin world, what it solves is that the, you know, the fiat currency is controlled by a government. The issuance of it, the amount of it, all that kind of stuff. Uh, in the crypto or in the blockchain world, the currency could be tethered to a dollar, but it's not a dollar. So the exchange of value really is a digital layer of exchange, a digital layer of value exchange that really replaces fiat currency. It's not owned by a government. No government controls the supply. The blockchain just does what it does. Uh, so you couldn't do that with any country's fiat currency. You really had to create a unique currency that wasn't owned by anybody that the blockchain itself could create over time through like proof of work when mining is creating these coins and that's how they get created and there's no way to inflate that or deflate that. You know. and as, as, years, uh, I mean, as years progress, so the amount of 
computation which the miners do that will go on increasing as the as the ledgers go on uh, building up yeah it, the amount of this is kind of what drives me crazy about Bitcoin or about proof of work is the amount of processing power is way beyond what would be needed to simply mine the blocks, right? And so what happens is, and this is what's happened in Bitcoin, is that uh, a bunch of guys were mining Bitcoin on their computers, right? Their GPUs, their CPUs. Some guys figured out I could put a bunch of GPUs and mine it. All of a sudden, these new machines are built that you can go buy a thousand of those machines and put them in a warehouse in China, and now you're making like 20% of the Bitcoin, you know? And I think that hash power is not at all associated with what's needed to run the blockchain. The blockchain is run as part of these things because they're earning the right to mine the block. Once they earn the right to mine the block, that's a simple little thing. That's a simple data processing thing, right? So. All this hash power is really designed to simply make it hard to get a Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, make it very, very hard, very expensive, take a long time to generate a Bitcoin. And so that's why when people, some people are critical of cryptocurrency, will say, oh, it's just funny money. It came out of thin air. It did not come out of thin air. No, some of them have. But those that have been mined, like Bitcoin and Ethereum and others, you know, they are systematically being created. But you know, one of the questions I've been asked as a consultant was, is there anything we could do with these machines besides them running this silly lottery thing? And the reality is, no. I mean, there's some people that have said, well, we could give the machine like SETI problems or you know, computational problem that you know, we're really trying to solve some massive you know, issue that requires a lot of computation. These things are not at all designed for that. They're designed to do the simple hashing at millions of hashes per second. And that's all they're designed to do. And it's a grotesque use of computers. Uh, so I, I do it <laughs> because that's how we make cryptocurrency today. But I think in the future, there's definitely better proof of stake and these other mechanisms will really revolutionize the way we make cryptocurrency. Okay. Is it good? Thank you so much. That was a long, long time. So, I appreciate your time. I can tell the excitement about this talk. So if you have uh, any further questions. Well, I have a couple of shirts. I don't know who might want a shirt. But I'll just look. I'll just throw them around here. I've got to fix all of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry, the uh, looks like we. I don't know the size. Oh. <laughs> anyway, we're gonna talk. Oh, yeah. see you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.